Every battle is both a victory and a defeat. It depends which flag you fly. In every theater of the Second World War, battles won and lost determine possession of territory, of resources, and of the strength to go on fighting. For some of the battles, it was the victory that most influenced the future course of the war. For others, it was the defeat. This is the story of the battles won and lost that decided the outcome of the greatest conflict in history. A war that reached every continent and touched every sort of terrain demanded every sort of strategy. In this episode, we examine battles fought at sea and in the jungle, in city streets, in invasions from the air, and retreats from the land. Spring in Paris, over the Eiffel Tower, over the cities and towns of Europe hangs a pall of fear and death. The German invasion of France could hardly have gone better for the Germans. The German blitzkrieg against Western Europe opens on the 10th of May 1940, and within a fortnight, the British and French and Belgian armies are defeated. They're withdrawing to the Channel Coast. It looks as if the Second World War in the West will be over literally within weeks. The Wehrmacht advance was remorseless. Army Group A, in the center of the offensive, wheeled towards the coast, pushing the French First Army and the British Expeditionary Force towards the sea with the finesse of a sheepdog. Pressing from the north, von Bock's Army Group B further penned the Allied force. And soon, three German armies, von Kluger's 4th, von Kuchler's 18th, and von Reichenau's 6th were moving in for what must have been the coup de grace. On the 4th of June, German troops entered the port of Dunkirk. But they did not defeat and imprison the hundreds of thousands of troops that they had penned there. And though there are solid reasons why they did not, what happened between May 23rd and June 4th must, albeit with hindsight, be classed as a German mistake with quite significant consequences. By the 23rd of May, the Belgian army had been isolated and the British and first French forced against the sea. Von Rundstedt, commanding Army Group A, issued what has famously become known as the Stop Order. The Germans have been fighting for three weeks invading Western Europe. Uh, their forces are exhausted. So the German generals, and not as many people think, Hitler, order them to stop on the, the perimeter of the Dunkirk beaches. So in effect, the Germans hand the Western Allies a, a few days' grace. So why did von Rundstedt and Hitler halt their smashing offensive? The Panzer divisions had been reduced by 30% in the Blitzkrieg that had brought them to the Channel and the bulk of the French military machine lay undefeated, as indeed did the greater part of France. The Germans were concerned about the, the potential for an Allied counterattack, and they're, they're fighting an army which basically won the First World War. So the Germans are concerned that their enemy is giving in too easily. So yeah, there was a very, very uh, sensible prudence on the part of the German commanders, who also knew that their own troops were disorganized by success. When Hitler visited von Rundstedt, his acceptance of the stop order was made easier by the assurances of Reichsmarshal Hermann Göring, 
who agitated for and guaranteed the success of leaving it to his Luftwaffe to finish off the trapped Allied troops. The country around Dunkirk is not suitable for armoured warfare. It's, it's flat, but it's cut up by canals and drainage ditches. In fact, it's, a, it's very similar to the fighting in the First World War in, in Flanders, which the, the senior commanders on both sides, including Hitler, remembered from 20 years before. On the day that Hitler and Goering made their plans, the British commander, Lord Gort, took a unilateral decision. He would not risk losing his entire command by participating in General Wagan's proposed and wildly optimistic offensive, which imagined a breakout to link up with forces further south. Gort decided instead to withdraw the British expeditionary force on Dunkirk, from which they could be evacuated, to fight another day. That evacuation, Operation Dynamo, would begin on May 26th. Gort's was not the only unilateral decision of the unravelling alliance. On May 27th, without consulting his allies, King Leopold of Belgium offered his surrender to the Germans. Admiral Bertram Ramsey, who had been alerted as early as May 20th of the possible need for an evacuation, had brought together a large and decidedly motley collection of vessels with which to carry off the troops assembling at Dunkirk. British ships, cruisers, destroyers, yachts, paddle boats, anything that could float, for the British were determined to save their men. The shortest route had to be abandoned when Calais fell, and ships would have been within range of the Calais shore batteries. The second, Route X, was vulnerable to unswept mines. And so, the longest passage, north to the Quinte Boy, west to the Goodwin Sands lightship, and south to Dover, a journey of 160 kilometers, was chosen of necessity. As it became clear what was happening, the Luftwaffe's action against the evacuation intensified. Which spread the panic to the civilian population. Lord, men, women and children with bags dragging little trucks the children weren't talking or playing, all with vacant, vacant expressions, just looking straight ahead. The pullback on Dunkirk was not a rout. Beginning on the 26th, the forces conducted an orderly, phased withdrawal to a 25-kilometer perimeter, defining a pocket 10 to 12 kilometers deep. The BEF disabled its equipment, spiked and abandoned its guns, and fell back. Had it not been for this discipline, had there been panic, what happened at Dunkirk would not have been possible. There, the efficient evacuation was underway. 25,000 men had been taken off by the end of the second day of the operation. By May 31st, the day of the largest total taken off, the figure had risen to 68,014. The harbour is full of sunken ships and at the quayside, I could see somebody running in front of me. I could see him running and he was running and I thought, oh, that ship's got smoke coming out of the funnel. So I ran like mad as well and it was just pulling away from the quayside and I managed to get aboard. I just jumped aboard. Thank God. The effectiveness of the Luftwaffe was restricted. The bombers could not operate at night. Visibility was limited by frequent mists, although calm seas favored the evacuation fleet, and the Royal Air Force could sufficiently harass German aircraft to restrict their effect. By the end of Operation Dynamo, the RAF had lost 177 aircraft, the Germans 240. Had the Germans not halted on the 23rd, 
it is unlikely that such an evacuation could have been conducted. The evacuation of Dunkirk means several things. I mean, in sheer practical terms, it means that the British have literally hundreds of thousands of men to continue the fight. Secondly, they've got not just British troops, but French troops especially. So there's a free French army created in Britain because of, of the evacuation of Dunkirk. Though the British troops had lost their equipment, they had boosted morale and the will to resist. Anyway, the BEF has come back, and whatever the disasters that have led to their return, we at home are mighty glad to have them here. And when, on their return, Churchill made his defiant, we shall fight on the beaches, we shall never surrender speech, he spoke for the nation. It is an enormous psychological boost. I mean, we still talk about the Dunkirk spirit, because although it was a massive defeat, it was a psychological victory, which the British drew on for the rest of the war. In 1937, Japan launched a full-scale invasion of China. It did not go to plan. Progress was slow, resistance more stubborn than had been anticipated. In 1939, Japanese colonial ambitions suffered a further check on the Mongolian border, where Soviet troops inflicted a decisive defeat. It all strengthened the hand of that faction in the military, which argued that Japan's expansion should be south. To Japan, it was the southern resources area, and dressed up as the greater East Asia co-prosperity sphere, it would give Japan all of the living space and raw material that she needed. What we need to remember here is that this is an age largely before synthetic products that Japan had been fighting a very costly war in China. The way that it saw finishing that war was it needed more resources. The Japanese leadership saw that they had no choice but to seize the resources of the Netherlands East Indies. Not only are the Dutch East Indies of great strategic value, but also they contain great material wealth. Oil, for instance. Their aims were to do it quickly, so they could release the troops needed to send them back to fight the war in China, so that they could grab those resources in the Netherlands East Indies and start shipping them back to Japan before the United States started to gear up for war. December 7th, 1941. As Japanese aircraft were approaching Pearl Harbor, Japanese forces under General Tomoyuki Yamashita were already going ashore on the Malay Peninsula at Kotabaru. Some of their early successes were all about simultaneous operations. A cross broad swathe of Asia and the Pacific. So the British and American forces in the Asia Pacific, you know, they were spread out trying to react to the Japanese. A lot of these places were very weakly garrisoned as well, so the Japanese were very quickly seizing them and then moving on because part of their battle plans were that troops required for one operation were then moved relatively quickly on to the next. So they didn't have time to do that. At the end of 1941, hardly more than three weeks after the code words Tora 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 had sent in the raid on Pearl Harbor, the Japanese were now poised for a full-scale invasion of Burma, the conquest of the Philippines, the assault on Singapore, and the defeat of the Dutch in the resource-rich Dutch East Indies. As Churchill said of the fall of France, how could it have happened so quickly? The reasons for victory can be seen in the campaign in Malaya. They were repeated through the co-prosperity sphere and were fundamental to Japan's early success. When Japanese transports, more than 20 of them, brought Yamashita's army group ashore at seven sites on December 8th, they were virtually unopposed. British forces were in their habitual deployment, particularly in strength around the Butterworth base, and had not been moved despite the growing threat of Japanese militarism and the presence of the Japanese force across the Gulf of Siam. 
the 5th Infantry Division quickly secured the air bases at Patani and Singora. Taking Singora, where the peninsula narrows, made possible the movement of Japanese forces across to the west coast. And that meant that Yamashita could advance on two fronts, dividing the defenders. The Japanese maintained flexibility in action. The east coast, thinly defended, was little more than a march southwards. The west coast required different tactics, and they got them. Hook actions either left strong defensive positions impotent in the wake of troops that had bypassed them, or more usually, encircled and smashed them. In places, these hooks meant moving through jungle that the British had deemed impassable, an echo of the French mistake that was exposed by the advance through the Ardennes. The terrain is exploited by the Japanese in a way that it's not by the British. They never quite managed to work out how to prevent the Japanese outflanking, both using the forested areas, but also what the Japanese do in Malaya as well, is make use of small craft to outflank British positions on the land by outflanking movements using the sea. All the early reports from Malaya spoke of heavy and confused fighting with the Japanese gaining ground. This is typical Malayan country, almost the only place in which troops can deploy being the plantation. The Japanese had been specifically trained in jungle warfare. The British and Commonwealth forces had not. Their strategy had suffered from traditional textbook planning, planning which had, in a way, suffered from imperial hubris. There's a lot of racial prejudice underlies the Allies' initial reading of what the Japanese military is capable of. And so it underestimates its ability to manoeuvre. It underestimates its ability to fight. It underestimates its willingness to utilise the terrain to its advantages. It underestimates the capabilities of its aircraft. And thus the Japanese are able to wrest control of the skies in areas that they're fighting very quickly. Speed was fundamental to Japanese military thinking. So it was engineered into every aspect of the operation. Troops, not only in the Malay campaign, but everywhere and throughout the war, travelled with very little in the way of support. When, by the 21st of December, British formations received the order to concentrate on a line behind the Parak River, it was too late. Japan would continue to record victories, pushing and pushing faster than their opponents could recover, so that Singapore, the Philippines and the East Indies would all fall. If there was a true blitzkrieg in the Second World War, it was this one. In a matter of weeks, Japan had gained for itself one-sixth of the surface of the planet. It seems for a while that you have this superhuman enemy, this, this soldier who can keep going and going, who fights like the devil, who doesn't fight the way that Western forces expect to fight. It also means that there's a vast amount of territory that if the Allies are going to win the war, that they have to recapture from the Japanese. But after six months, the seeming invincibility of Japan was stopped in a great naval battle in a place called Midway. United Kingdom's position as a great power, which she possessed at the start of the Second World War, was not a consequence of the wealth or weather or natural resources of the British Isles. It rested on her empire, a vast maritime empire, the greatest the world had known. And the integrity of that empire rested not on a large standing army, it depended on the Royal Navy. The Royal Navy facing only Germany before the fall of France was a dominant force and continued to have the strategic advantage of effectively sitting astride of Germany's exits to the globe. It had eight major groups located in the Atlantic at the time that the Germans could barely deploy two battle cruisers and a number of submarines. Before the war began, the German pocket battleship, 
Admiral Graf Spee sailed for the South Atlantic. And there she waited. Chief interest, of course, attaches to the famous pocket battleships, which are only 10,000 tons, but mount six 11-inch guns and have a speed of 26 knots. Once war had started, the Graf Spee began her operations. Between the end of September and the end of October, she sank six vessels in an area that straddled a major sea lane for ships, traveling around the Cape of Good Hope. Well, the Graf Spee was in the South Atlantic as part of a deliberate campaign to interrupt, to destroy the global uh, shipping movements, to slow and interrupt the movement of resources to and from the United Kingdom. By November, the Royal Navy had formed six task forces to find and sink the battleship. In early December, Graf Spee claimed two more victims, but they did not go down without sending radio signals that influenced Commodore Harwood, commanding Force G, to concentrate his forces on the Falkland Islands. Captain Langsdorff, commanding Graf Spee, made two blunders. The first was that spotting the smoke of four of Harwood's cruisers and mistaking them for destroyers on escort duty, he closed to the attack. What followed, history knows as the Battle of the River Plate. Captain Langsdorff of Graf Spee, it was his duty not to engage British warships. It was his duty to preserve that ship undamaged. As soon as he detected British ships, he should have tried to go in the opposite direction. Langsdorff engaged Exeter and Ajax, Royal Navy, and Achilles, Royal Navy, New Zealand Division. As soon as he realized his mistake, he sped towards the enemy to prevent them from outpacing him. Graf Spee had diesel engines, the British vessels steam which could not accelerate rapidly. Graf Spee engaged Exeter at 17,000 meters at 0618. She had turned northwest against the Germans' approach. Haar would actually split the cruisers, so they came at Langsdorff from two directions, which unnerved him a bit. Ajax and Achilles, turning together northeast, forced Langsdorff to spread his fire. After two minutes, Exeter was returning fire, but Graf Spee had far superior weaponry. In fact, it inflicted quite significant damage on the three British cruisers, which were undergunned compared to the 11-inch guns that he had. They had eight and six-inch guns. By 0630, Ajax and Achilles had closed to 12,000 meters, forcing the German gunners to divide their main armament. After nearly an hour, Admiral Graf Spee was finished. Far from out of the fight, still sailing and seaworthy, but done for, because a shell from Exeter, herself badly damaged and soon to retire from the battle, had damaged the battleship's fuel plant. Graf Spee now had fuel for only 16 hours sailing, which meant she could not get home. Neither could the damage be repaired at sea. Langsdorff consulted the charts. He would head for the nearest neutral port. And that was Montevideo at the mouth of the River Plate. There she is, the Admiral Graf Spee, in Montevideo Harbor, where she took refuge after the hammering she received from her small adversary. In Montevideo, Langsdorff released the 61 British merchant seamen he had taken on board as survivors of vessels he had sunk and sought permission to remain in port long enough to make repairs. The British had only one further vessel close enough to blockade Graf Spee. But that's not what they broadcast. False intelligence painted a picture of Force H, a large British force including the aircraft carrier Ark Royal, assembling to finish the German the moment she sailed from port. Langsdorff committed his second blunder. He believed the false intelligence. He 
he did have an idea that there were stronger forces waiting for him than were in fact the case. But it is true, given the damage he'd already had in the first action, that the Graf's Bay immediately leaving uh, Montevideo would have been forced into another action and would have received further damage, which would have left her, in my view, absolutely open to being hunted down and destroyed by the much more powerful forces that were concentrating on the River Plate at that time. On December 17th, facing limited choices, he sailed his ship into the estuary and ordered it scuttled. Tremendous explosions aft have wrecked the vessel and there she lies, abandoned to the flames by captain and crew. Not to be sunk in open fight by the enemy, not to go down with her colours flying like the royal pin did, but to be blown up, abandoned, scuttled in an act of defeatism which has rightly earned the contempt of all decent people. Two days later, Hans Langsdorff shot himself. Even as an army marches to certain victory, a wrong step can lead to a setback, a defeat. The Allies had been grinding on from their Normandy beachhead, moving north and east, pushing the Germans back and approaching slowly against resistance towards the Rhine and the moment when they would set foot on German soil. Market Garden is a bizarre battle because it arises from Field Marshal Bernard Montgomery's desire to bolt into Germany. Field Marshal Montgomery, the British commander, and Dwight Eisenhower, the American Supreme Commander, had a very uneasy relationship. They had fundamentally different ways of commanding, of projecting themselves, and they disagreed about the strategy for the Allied advance into Germany, which they had to do in order to defeat the Third Reich. Eisenhower, I think sensibly, wanted to advance on a broad front. Montgomery had a bizarre idea to punch a hole in the German defences, to break into the North German plain. Montgomery hoped his plan might also answer those critics of his conduct following D-Day, when some had thought him overly cautious. Operation Market Gun was not a cautious plan, and following Eisenhower's approval, he received the troops and resources that he needed. The new move was shaping up, and everybody knew it would be another of those combined operations. And it was going to be that knockout punch we'd all been sweating out. Market Gardens basically two operations. Market is the airborne operation, where they drop airborne troops beyond the bridges. Garden is the land advance to join up with those airborne forces. And it sounds like a sensible idea, except, as the phrase goes, it was a bridge too far. For Montgomery's plan to work, it was essential that every phase of the operation was a success. Every bridge secured. Douglas C-47 aircraft, Dakotas to the British, were the workhorses of the operation. They carried the first Allied airborne army, and they towed the gliders. About 2,000 aircraft of various types were involved. Troops dropped in by glider or chute were to grasp and secure the bridges. Following them would be the British 30th Corps under General Brian Horrocks. If Horrocks could bring his men up in time, if the airborne divisions could take and hold the bridges until 30th Corps got through, the German flank would be turned on the Rhine. If. On September 17th, the operation was launched. Then we were over the DZ, and it was red on, stand up, hook up, green on, go, and out we went. Feet together, head down, shoulders round, feet together, watch the ground, boom, that was it. 101st Airborne quickly secured the canal bridges. 82nd took Grava, but was forced back from Nijmegen by a strong counter-attack. But on the 18th, 30th Corps linked with the 101st, 
and the next day, supporting the 82nd, renewed pressure on the bridge at Nijmegen. The bridge fell to them, and Operation Market had succeeded. The British 1st Airborne had achieved its initial objective on the first day, the 17th. Both paratroop and glider units were well grouped, and after a hard fight, the bridge over the Rhine was secured. Three battalions made north, center, and southerly advances, but only 2nd Battalion in the south had reached its final objective on the northern approaches of the bridge. And there, it stuck. The bridge was a long way ahead of 30th Corps, a bridge too far, in fact, unless German resistance was moderate. It wasn't. By this stage of the war, the Western Allies have got almost total command of the German secret intelligence. They're reading German messages virtually as soon as they're sent. What they did know, but what wasn't passed on to the troops who were responsible for actually carrying out this operation, was that in exactly the place where the paratroops were to be dropped, there was a German panzer division resting and re-equipping. So they literally dropped the 1st Allied Airborne Army onto the top of a German SS panzer division. And that's where things started to unravel, for they were strong units. They were the 9th and 10th SS Panzer Divisions, and they pressed on the British bridgehead with superior numbers and weaponry. On the 21st, the Polish brigade was dropped south of the Rhine. They had been delayed in joining the battle by bad weather and poor intelligence dropped them into strong German positions where, instead of being able to force a way through to reinforce 1st Airborne, they were cut to pieces. The airborne troops are, comparatively speaking, only lightly armed. And landing behind the enemy's lines, they face the prospect of engaging fully equipped, heavily armed forces, thus all the hazards of an isolated operation. Further compounding 1st Airborne's situation was the loss of their drop zones. Malfunctioning radios made it almost impossible to advise the RAF of this. And consequently, vital resupply fell into the wrong hands. Of 390 tons of supplies dropped, only 31 tons were received by the British division. We went in there on Sunday and fought from there until Wednesday afternoon. Man, there weren't many of us left then, and ammunition was pretty well non-existent. General Urquhart, commanding 1st Airborne, made the decision to pull his men to a defensible position to await relief by the overdue 30th Corps. This meant abandoning 2nd Battalion, which had reached the northern end of the bridge. German troops, meanwhile, cut across the British line of advance south of Uden, further slowing the relieving column. On the 26th, nine days after the drop, 30th finally linked up with 1st Airborne, but it was too late to affect a battle that had been lost. Market Garden is an abs absurd Allied defeat at the very moment where the Allies are gloriously advancing through France and Belgium liberating the country as they go. It should never have happened. The Allies are massively well equipped, they've got more weapons, more equipment, more intelligence than the Germans, but they fail to use it. Of 10,000 who had landed at Arlen, 2,000 marched out with 30th Corps. Most of the rest saw out the remainder of the war as prisoners of the Germans. Market Garden certainly doesn't do Montgomery's reputation any good. Eisenhower already knows that he's a hard man to work with, and Market Garden puts the cap on it. It has another effect, of course, and that is, is that the Allies are not going to get to the Mars and certainly not get across the Rhine in 1944. And of course, it means that Eisenhower's actually right, that you can't simply drive your column into North Germany and expect to win. You've got to advance on a broad front, and that's exactly what the Allies do in 1945, and that's what gets the Germans defeated in the West. The overwhelming size of significant actions, like the landings at Normandy, 
or Japan's epic sweep through the Asia-Pacific region dominate our view of war, distracting us from campaigns unfairly referred to as sideshows. But some sideshows have real strategic significance, and all of them involve real fighting, real destruction, real death. In the wash-up from the First World War, Britain and France, then the possessors of the world's two great maritime empires, had divided the Middle East between them. With the fall of France, the collaborationist government was allowed to retain control of French colonies. So it was that opposing forces faced each other across the desert frontier. French standards, symbolic of the nation's honor, sailed for safekeeping in French African territory. France had carved out Lebanon and Syria, both guarding the eastern Mediterranean and Syrian astride routes into Iran, then Persia, a major source of vital oil. And neighboring the British sphere of influence in Iraq, where rebellion against the British had only been curbed in May. On June 8th, a joint British, Commonwealth and Free French force moved into Lebanon and Syria with the expectation that the 45,000 strong Vichy French garrison would surrender and march over to the Allied cause. But it did not, and six weeks of fierce fighting ensued before the Vichy French lost the battle. And 6,000 were counted as casualties. The Vichy French resisted skillfully along all three of the Allied routes of advance. On the coastal sector, fierce fighting occurred at the Litani River on the 9th of June, and on the 12th of June, it was decided to transfer the bulk of the forces to the coastal advance, where good progress was being made by the 10th Indian Division and Free French forces. Much of the Vichy force comprised French colonial troops. The Vichy troops dug themselves in well at all points, often holding fire to point-blank range. But this only made our fellows all the more determined to finish off the job. When Australian James Heather Gordon charged a machine gun emplacement during the Battle of Jezim, an action for which he was awarded the Victoria Cross, he found that he had been fighting not Frenchmen, but Senegalese. The Allied advance stalled on Jebel Abu Atriz, where a flanking move by free French tanks was stopped by heavy shelling from Vichy artillery. And troops holding Canetra on the other main road to Damascus reported the approach of a strong Vichy force from the north. Two companies of free French troops were sent to reinforce defensive positions across the road. By 0900, on the 15th of June, Indian troops were pushing forward into the hills and within an hour had captured Tel Kisue. By 11.30, three French Marines had secured the village of Montkelbe. In the second phase of the attack, three French were fighting Vichy French. The very tragedy that General de Gaulle had wanted to avoid at Dakar. What a comment on the so-called honor of the Vichy leaders that they should have ordered their men to fight not only their former British allies, but even the free French, their own countrymen. During the night of the 15th of June, Indian troops took Artus on the Canetra to Damascus Road, cutting the communications of the Vichy force advancing on Canetra. But their approach was too slow. On the afternoon of the 16th of June, the Allies at Canetra outnumbered three to one and facing tanks against which they had no effective counter surrendered. But by the 18th of June, the situation had been restored. Allied focus switched to Damascus, which fell on the 21st of June. On that day, a mixed force of British troops, including those of the Arab Legion, entered Syria from Iraq and advanced on Palmyra, which was attacked on the 25th of June. The Vichy forces held out for nine days before surrendering. Finally, the entry into Damascus. You could hardly say the population looked gloomy about our arrival, could you? 
After the capture of Damascus, the drive on Beirut, chiefly the Australian 7th Division, became the main Allied focus. On the 10th of July, the Australians were within 10 kilometers of Beirut. The British 4th Cavalry Brigade was closing on Homs, and the 10th Indian Division was advancing into northern Syria. Of course, the importance of our occupation of Syria hardly needs stressing. Success in Syria justifies us in choking one more mark against Hitler. The Vichy French commander, General Henry Dentz, sought an armistice. He had lost the battle, and his command of 38,000 surviving troops was given the option to be returned to Vichy France or to join the Free French forces. Less than 6,000 elected to join the Free French. That mattered less than the control that Britain now had in the Middle East. The Eastern Mediterranean, the Suez Canal, and the Arab oil fields were all more defensible because of the sideshow in Syria. On the 25th of April, 1945, American and Soviet troops made contact. The link-up between the Americans and the Russians at the River Elba near Torgau marked the climax of the two great advances into the heart of Germany from west and east. It was colossal news. On the same day, the Red Army completed its encirclement of Berlin. Berlin, at the same time, became a, a fortress city. That was the special concept, meaning that the city was to be defended at all costs to the last cartridge, to the last bullet, to the last man. Defensive preparations were made in depth, but resources were far from elite. The uh, numbers in Berlin, well, there are no uh, concrete numbers. It, mostly it was a mishmash of units, so police units, Hitler Youth units, and uh, Volkssturm units, just people's militia, made of those who were not able to serve in the regular army because they were either too young or too old or had some sicknesses, health issues, pretty much everything they could get. The 12th Army, west of the city, comprised 12 divisions that were a grab bag of raw recruits. Von Manteuffel's 3rd Panzer Army, north of the city, comprised nine divisions, none of which was Panzer. The total deployed in defense of the capital was some 50 in different divisions. Coming towards them were almost 200 divisions of the Red Army. And as they came, they scorched the earth. The Soviet offensive was designed to ensure the fall of Berlin no later than May Day, May the 1st. Soviet forces began to move on April the 12th. Air raids continued to pummel the city. The Berliners, they built tram barricades, piles of rubble to block the streets, but how could that help really? Because seven Soviet armies were advancing exactly on Berlin, and, and the Berlin garrison had less than a hundred thousand men. This is less than a core against seven Soviet full able-bodied armies. So their situation was dire, to say the least. Zhukov's first Belarusian front in the center, Konev's first Ukrainian front to his south. Rokossovsky's second Belarusian to his north would race each other for the prize. On April 16th, Zhukov's offensive began when three red flares shot skywards and 140 searchlights were turned on in the eyes of the enemy. Then three green flares signaled the start of a ground-shattering bombardment. Literally so shocking that entire villages collapsed and whole forests exploded as 8,983 Soviet guns opened up. The bombardment lasted for 35 minutes. Then abruptly, neatly, it stopped. And the Red Army moved forward. 
More than six million men and women with one thing in mind. Zhukov, advancing from his bridgehead on the Oder, was aiming for the heart of the city. The Germans, mostly the SS units, they were tough in battle, but nothing could save them. This, this is obvious, though, because the Soviet soldiers, they were so close to the victory that they were waiting for, fighting for, hoping for, for four years. Now there is a moment of revenge, especially for those who lost their loved ones or who went through the occupied territories in the Soviet Union, saw the horrible massacres and all the outcomes of the genocidal policy that the German state was uh, executing in the occupied Eastern territories. So now they were fighting with even more rage, more anger. Retribution is incidental in the course of military operations, but certainly here in Berlin there was all the evidence of it. Retribution for the havoc caused by Hitler's Huns in Leningrad and Warsaw, London, Coventry, Rotterdam and all the devastated cities of the Allies. On the 26th, the city center was ringed and Soviet forces advancing house to house, room to room, moved in. Their objective was the Reichstag. Ехал Берлин. Ну, в Берлине воевали сложно было, конечно, мы прорывались к Рейхстагу, помогали пехоте туда продвигаться, пробивались и все везде это. Нас тоже много подожили наших машин, много. я как-то остался, говорит, ничего. Берлин was hell, pretty much. This was hell. A number of those who fought, they remember that it was hard to tell if it was night or day because thick black smoke was covering the sunlight. The smoke that was lit by the fires of knocked out tanks and buildings. Screams in the air, screams of those wounded, because Berlin was full of civilians that of course were dying during the course of the battle. And uh, dust from the destroyed buildings was always in the air. It was hard to breathe all the time, it cracked on the teeth of those who fought. On April 30th, after first successfully testing the poison on his beloved dog Blondie, Hitler and his new bride bit down on cyanide capsules, at which point Hitler, to be certain, shot himself in the temple. The Red Army was 200 meters away. The next day, the Reichstag fell and the red flag was famously hoisted on its roof. General Helmut Weidling, commanding the military garrison, surrendered the city. Berlin as a capital, as a city even, was dead. This was what remained of the Reichstag, the building which gained worldwide notoriety when the Nazis seized power. Дальше картинка сразу. Берлин преобразился. Покрылся белым цветом из окон, балконов, Где только можно белые полотнища, простые, простые наручки, что угодно бело было вывешивали берлинское население, но не подтверждало, само капитулировало, сообщало о своей безоговорочной капитуляции. The battle for the capital had cost more than 300,000 Soviet casualties, perhaps a similar number of German casualties and in addition 480,000 German prisoners who had failed in their attempt to break out west to surrender to the American, British and French forces from whom they expected kinder treatment. The uh, capital has fallen, but the uh, resistance still uh, was uh, going in the north. Some troops were still fighting for the third empire that did not exist, that lasted for only 12 years. The last of the last, they just decided to give themselves in uh, late May 1945. This was the end of the Reich.